Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 184 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at the sort of questions someone new to electric vehicles would ask. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. This particular episode is in partnership with EVA England, the body representing electric vehicle owners in England. See the show notes for membership details and links to their website. Before we start, I wanted to let you know about next week's guest, Louis Cole. Louis is a YouTuber who did something quite spectacular last year. He converted an old Volkswagen camper van to electric and, with almost no testing and experience driving it, drove from Los Angeles right the way across to New York right before Christmas. Now, I don't know if you recall the weather back at that time, but let's just say it didn't all go to plan. We'll be talking all about that and the lessons learned as he builds his neck, the EV conversion, an original VW Beetle. Our main topic of discussion today is something a little different. We did an episode at the beginning of last season called the Newbie episode. In that, I discussed some of the things a new EV owner should do when they first get their electric vehicle. Well, one person who listened to that is Liz Allen. Liz got a Hyundai Ioniq 38 kilowatt hour recently, and I sent her the link to the podcast so she could have a listen. Well, shortly after that, she invited me onto her podcast so we could chat about the work I'm doing here at EV Musings, and so she could ask me the sort of questions a new EV driver would ask when they basically have a lot of trepidation and some hesitancy about the whole EV world, and they want some advice from someone who's been there. So what you're about to listen to are excerpts from the podcast where we discuss, amongst other things, what brought her to electric, financial considerations of going electric, what caused her the most stress, and AC charging versus DC charging. If you want to listen to the whole episode in which Liz and I chat about a whole load of different things, the link to that episode is in the show notes. But first, let's welcome Liz. Thank you very much for inviting me, Gary. It's absolutely amazing to be here. Thank you. And you're a newbie, a relative newbie to driving electric vehicles. So I'm going to be um, sort of picking your brain about your experience with electric vehicles and how you got into it and what sort of happened since you've got your first one. And we'll, we'll talk about that and it should be a lot of fun. Before, obviously, you've gone through this process of getting a charger installed and getting the solar panels and that. And I've, I've done that as well. But I'm, I'm sort of interested from an electric vehicle point of view, what were the key stress points that you experienced or you thought you were going to experience prior to taking delivery to the car, uh, uh, of the car? You've got the Hyundai Ionic, I think, the 38 kilowatt hour. Lovely car, the wind knife. So before you, you got that, what was it that was concerning you? Was it, for example, I'm not going to be able to do long distances. Was it, I'm not going to be able to do public charging. What were the worries that you had? Do you know, I think I was quite open-minded about it. I think the biggest, the biggest thing for us was actually over a period of time in the run-up to it, we did, we did lots and lots of research. Now, now the, yes, we've, I'd never heard of it called the wind knife, but you're the second person that's Nick Hewlin from Chargy also called it that. And I was like, oh my God, okay. But I suppose the biggest thing was it's such a change for us to go from a petrol car to something very, very different. It was, and we, we'd, we'd stayed with VW for some time. I know, I know you've got an ID3 at the moment, haven't you? So we'd been with, I, with, with VW for a while. So, and actually I took lots and lots of cars out for test drive. And, and actually Rich, my husband, he's, he's not particularly a car person. He would rather take public transport. So, so in the, in the run up to this, it was kind of trying to understand, right, which, which was the right car for us. Was it, was a, was a lease a good thing? Was, a you know, kind of actually, um, buying it outright. And so they, you know, if you buy a brand new car, it's an EV, they're so expensive and we've never, ever bought brand new, but kind of alongside that it was, a lot of it was, Right. Okay. So what does this actually mean for us as a family? What are we going to have to do differently that we're not currently doing? So with my petrol, with with the Golf, I knew I could get 520 miles to a tank. 
unless I put the AC on if it was hot. But <laughs> the time we're recording this, it's really not been hot at all, has it? Actually, although I've got sunshine outside the house today. So, so, so it wasn't, it was understanding as well. So how many, how many char- charging apps do I actually need to have on my phone? And I think I probably got about 20 on, on there at the moment, you know, so it's kind of like, right, what, cause I'm a bit of a, I have, I'm anally organized. So before we actually got delivery and I knew that I was going to be starting long journeys up to Coventry, the first one was only down, down to Bournemouth. So actually that was quite a baby journey and but that's another race. That was a very, very first experience that was very, very stressful for me. But I put myself under stress on that first journey. But o- overall, it was kind of understanding everything. What, so even even things like we've got a Zappy charger and we've got solar panels, but we've not had very much sun. So what tariff is the best for us to be on for our Zappy? So that actually when we haven't got any sun, we've depleted our battery. When do we charge it? How much is it going to cost us? How much is it going to cost us on a public charging network? So, and when we got the car and and it's, and, and like I say, this is like three, four weeks in, we're only just kind of getting, it's getting used to me and my driving because I'm the one who drives it most. And obviously there's this thing called the GOM that I was going to talk to you about and we need to, Talk. I need, we need to talk about the GOM because the ge- GOM, you're the one who introduced me to that word, the guessometer. I mean, my God, <laughs> it is so true, isn't it? You know, like normally, you know, you know, when you're in, when you, when I was in the petrol car, like I said, I could, I always set the trip back to zero. So when I filled up with petrol, I set the trip back, back to zero and I was looking at the average amount, you know, miles that I got. So like I say, I knew I got 520 around that. If I'd done less, I knew I'd had a bit of a crap journey or I'd had, like I say, I'd different, had the AC on. But for the GOM, oh my good God, I've got to say that was, that was ever so stressful. Just, just actually until it saw, until it got used to my driving style, you know, actually. So, okay, so what does that actually mean? What do I need to do to make sure that that is accurate? So I'd be pressing things and going and looking, you know, I'm kind of driving and I'm pressing the AC and going, oh, it's gone down by five miles and things like that. It, it, it's so, so that's some of the stress I was experiencing. As you say, nobody has a GOM on a petrol car or a diesel car. They, a lot of people do what you did, which is I'll reset it to zero and I know I'm going to get 500, but you're not because in winter, the 500 might only be 400. I had a, a guy I used to work with and he religiously tracked every gallon of petrol. He graphed it over the years. And when he graphed it, his, his uh, miles per gallon over these, it went in a, a proper um, sine wave. You could see where the winter, where the summer was, where the winter was. And the difference was, I mean, it's fairly substantial. You know, it was 20, 30% difference between winter and summer. So, you know, talking about having a GOM on a vehicle, it's a guessometer because it just makes a guess of what you're doing. And and I think I said on, on one of the podcasts, you know, within electric, you can be at the bottom of a, a hill and you can do two miles up the hill, but because you're going up the hill, the GOM will drop 10 or 12 miles and everyone goes, it's a panic. But then you get to the top and you go down the other side and suddenly you've got quite a lot of those 10 or 12 miles back. You can't do that in a fossil fuel car. You do the mileage, you'll, you'll, you'll lose the distance because you're having to do more work or the engines have to do more work going up the hill. You're not going to re- regain anything going back down the other side of the hill. So you're worse off. And this whole thing about the 500 mile range on a car, it's, I know a lot of people go for it. And I know you said that that's what you had on, on your old golf, but back in the day, my father, you know, bought a Jaguar. Oh yes. It had a 20 gallon fuel tank. And it did 12 miles to the gallon, 240 mile range. Oh, that's a guess, Cusler. But the vast majority of cars in the UK, electric cars in the UK, will do 200, 240, 250 miles in range. And that's a problem. But a Jaguar back then that did 240, oh, no, it's just, it's just uneconomical. No, you're right. I suppose, I suppose it is just because it is, it is so different seeing, you know, I mean, like, so I've just had, t- over the last two weeks, I've just had two journeys up to Coventry and Nuneaton and back. 
So I go to Nuneaton first and then onto onto Coventry kind of the second day and stay over wh- wherever. And and actually, so the first time I drove to Coventry, we we kind of, and I, I wrote about this on a, a post last week on LinkedIn, um, we'd only charged the car up to 80%. Now, th- this is something else I wanted to, to talk to you about anyway, but we charged the car up to, to 80%. Now, because it was my first long journey, it's 92 miles from from Caversham, where I live just outside Reading, up to Nuneaton, I was freaking out. I really was, because the gasometer was saying that I had something like 111 miles, you know, and I was just like, oh my God, but I can't, because this was the first first day on this new contract work that I was working on. And I didn't want, I just didn't need that extra undue stress. So, so, but I give them, I built in the one thing I do do, even with, even with the way my brain works, I'd, I'd kind of built in a lot of time at the front end <clears throat> because I always build that in, in case there's any, any kind of accidents on the motorway or, or, you know, anything, any kind of um, traffic jams or whatever, you know, so I built in enough time that actually I worked out that to give myself peace of mind. I could stop stop at Warwick Services. I knew that Warwick Services had a grid charge, a grid grid shift. <laughs> Sorry, Sam Clark and Toddington, <laughs> a grid serve charger. That's a new one, isn't it? A uh, grid charge. Um, but and so I stopped there, and I was back up to eighty percent within fifteen minutes. I had enough time to just go to go have a bit of a comfort break, go and get myself a bar of something that I shouldn't probably been eating, and then come back to the car, and it was up to eighty percent. Now, I'll tell you something that I hadn't ever noticed before because it's such such early days that when it gets to 80%, that noise stops. You know, the real kind of, and it's not loud. It's just kind of like, and actually I was like, oh, what's happened there then? And I looked, I looked on the dash and it was 80%. I was like, oh, that's bloody amazing. And this is the thing that a lot of people who don't drive electric vehicles get concerned about. Oh, but, you know, what happens if I've only got, 10 miles on the gom and, and my auntie in uh, Scotland goes into hospital and I've got to drive up there. How long am I going to have to sit and wait for a charge? And there's this impression or understanding that you're going to have to spend hours plugged into a charger to do that. And you've just proved that, no, you don't really. You can. Do, I mean, I, I think the longest I've ever, ever spent at a charger, 35 minutes. No, no, let, let, let me clap. I've spent 50 minutes at a charger. But that's because I got distracted chatting to somebody else about electric vehicles, completely lost track of time. And when I came back, I was at 95 or 98% or whatever it was, which I never do. But if I'm doing a journey and it's just me, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, if I'm really, really low and I know there's a long way I've got to go before the next charger, 30, 35 minutes. So it's not this hour, hour and a half, two hours, five hours or whatever people think. And Again, it's a mindset that people have, and you've got to have a little bit of faith, a little bit of confidence, or you've got to have sort of these conversations between people like you and I, where we go, well, actually, no, it seems as if it could be a problem, but in reality, it's not. Yeah. Do you know what? Once, once I'd actually experienced that, that kind of original sort of fear and, and, and then gone, right, okay, grid serves there. I know they work. Let's get on it. And and you know, I was uh, and I and actually, do you know the and the best thing was that twenty minutes. Just just that twenty minutes meant that I still was early to my appointment. The thing that I found hard is understanding, and might, this might just be me being a bit thick. Which charge point is which? It doesn't tell you. There's not a badge. This is number one. This is number two. So I was like. Well, I don't know which one it is. How I, how do I know? Oh, I'll just use contactless. But it worked. And I sat in the car, you know, and I actually had I had enough time to have a, go across the road, get a packet of crisps, come back, eat my sandwich. And I actually waited. I think I was there probably about 45 minutes. For it to, I did let it go to 100, 100%, which. But I set straight off back. No, but I'll tell you what it was. I wanted to see it at 100%. So that I knew that that 90 odd miles, I knew what I'd have when I got back home. So that next time when I set off, 
I knew what I needed before I set off. It was just me doing a little trial and working it out, you know. But actually, so please, and I know we're supposed to, you're supposed, we're supposed to be taking it in terms of questions, but I just need to ask you this question. How do I know which charge point is which on the app? I suppose it depends which app you've got. Uh, it depends what sort of charges you've got. I, I charge a reasonable amount. If I mean, I don't charge a lot when I'm uh, on public charging. I do most of mine at home. But when I'm away, I'm split basically between Osprey and Instavolt. A lot of the Instavolt charges that I've gone to are um, the old charge, well, say the old, the, the charge point ones. So they're not the big, grey, ugly ones. Um, and they're not the Alpatronic ones that they have at uh, the Danbury Hub, but they're the, the charge point ones, slightly curved at the front, got charge point written on the top. Nice big screen in the middle. And at the bottom on there, it tells you the charger description. Okay. Is it one of those 50-50 ones that keep, you have to keep waiting for five minutes till it comes round? No, 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 no. It's the, it's the later one than that. It's the later version of that. But it says at the bottom. So if you're at uh, Banbury, it might say Banbury 001. And next door, it might say Banbury. Well, actually, called, they call it Stroud Park, don't they? So it'd be Stroud Park 001 or Stroud Park 002 and do that. Because it wasn't... <laughs> When we went, when me and my friends went to Bright, uh, Bournemouth about three weeks ago, and it was literally two days after I got the car, and I can't, can't tell you how stressed I was. The, my stress levels were off the charts, absolutely off the charts. I mean, we had the car, we got the car on the Tuesday. We were all going away on the Friday, and I was just like panic attack, the whole nine yards, everything, but just because they are non EV drivers going in. The first time going in an EV for the very first time, and I didn't want to cock it up. So the question then is, why did you not go out and test public charging by yourself between the Tuesday and the Friday? Because I was so busy and I couldn't, I, I couldn't find a time to blooming do it. So you, you're right. No, but you know what? It wasn't that. It wasn't that, Gary. It was actually the whole, right, okay, I've hardly driven this. I'm not used to it. I've driven a VW for years. These are friends I've known for a very, very long time. And it was more about the fact that I wanted them to have a good ex. It wasn't just the charging. The charging was a tiny portion of that bit. But you should, I'll tell you about that in a second. But it, it was more the getting them in the car and seeing me feeling confident with it. It was too early. for. It's such a big, for me, even just, it sounds silly, but we, like I say, because we'd driven goals for years, it was a massive change for us to go into a bigger car that was a saloon and an EV. And it, and it was probably just, like I say, my brain works in a very specific way, you know, and it was just kind of my sort of um, insecurity about how I'd be able to manage the situation. But once we were on the way, it was, it was, it was fine. And actually, so I found, I found um, another Instavolt charger. So this was the first one we went to. And the story, actually, I've just given it, a, I've kind of given away what, what brand it was. So my apologies on this one. But we went into, in Boscombe, there's, there's a, a public, a, you know, a multi-story car park with no signage whatsoever. So we drove in and we were coming on the way back because I just, my thinking was, right, okay, to start off with, I want to make sure that we're charged up. We're going to have a cup of tea in the morning before we left anyway. So let's, let's charge up while we're having a cup of tea. And then, because I didn't want, I didn't want it to be, I knew there was only a couple of charges in, I think I can't remember where it was, Winchester Services. And I just thought, I want to make sure it's smooth because if those are, if those are kind of taken up and we have to wait, then that'll be a little bit annoying. So, and I knew that the charger close by was empty. I could see it on Zapmap. Drove there and, and actually I sat at the wrong charger, didn't I? I was trying to charge the one next door. Though, because I hadn't worked out which one was which. But then I realised that the first one was out, of, was out of action anyway. There was nothing on it. So I did, I did put it on that map that this one isn't working, you know, kind of thing. I hadn't got around to doing it on the Instabot, but I did that when I got home. But again, it was because my friend was stood next to it going, this one's doing something. And I, so I ended up reparking and starting the charge. So, so, you know, 
So that was, and uh, and when when we got it start when we, when it was charging, everybody everybody went, yeah, you could have done it, you know. And it wasn't, and actually, none of us made a big thing of it. It was just something I was learning, and they were helping me with. It was kind of, it was a, it was a tiny little problem. It was more annoying the fact that there it was there was no signage, and it was my friend that actually spotted where the charger was. So we had gone up a floor. And then we were kind of going round and then she went, oh, I can think I can see them right at the, at the other side. So we had to go up a floor again, come back down two floors, you know, to, we had, and to go back to that. So, so it was that, it was that kind of trying to, you know, they're there, you know you're there, but I don't know where the hell you are. If you go down any high street or any main road in the UK and you pass a petrol station or you approach a petrol station, you know it's there because it's got the big totems outside, it's got the logos, it's got the prices, it's got the facilities, and you can see it from a distance. But um, I went down to uh, Devon over the weekend uh, with podcast patron Ron Godfrey. Hi, Ron. And we went down and we stopped at Solstice Park on the A303. There are... Two lots of Instavolts, there's a grid serve, there's a BP Pulse, and there's a Tesla, and not a single one of them has any sign of in or indication of where they are in the, uh, the thing. Now, the grid serve one, if you drive around, it's very obvious because there's either six or eight of them and they take over a whole area of the car park. The two Instavolts, you could easily miss one of the in things because it's kind of round a corner at the Costa. The BP Pulse, I know it's there because I've seen it on ZapMap, but it's sort of up and around the back of a, uh, a hotel. And the Tesla ones are hidden behind a hedge. Now, if you're navigating using the Tesla app, it will take you straight there. But if you're not and you just think, well, well where are they? It's very, very easy to miss them. And I think this is a key problem. People, well, one of the things that people sort of push back against electric vehicles, well, there's nowhere to charge them. And, you know, you and I know there's 40 odd thousand different charging locations in the UK or charges in the look in the UK. But if, if the majority of them are quote unquote hidden or not accurately signposted, of course, people are going to go, well, they're not there because they can't see that the big totems that say, you know, grid serve or Instavolt or Osprey charging on them. Yeah. Now, obviously there are exceptions. You go to the electric four cord at Braintree or um, Norwich or the one that's going to be opened down in um, Gatwick by the end of this year. They're all well signposted. I say I was down in Devon at the Sam's Leap Osprey unit there. They bought the whole block of land, um, completely reconfigured. That's fantastic. It's got a farm shop and the whole lot. That's obvious. They've got the sign outside. It's easy to see. But again, those are exceptions rather than the, um, than the norm. So not sure what we, what we need to do about that, but something does need to change. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose if it's if it's in if it's in um like a a local authority car park, for example, there's got to be something on the on the contract or or something that is because we call it so in in business improvement we call it visual management. It's it is just like you said about like with the you know kind of the petrol forecourts or or when you're dri you know driving normally you'll see a sign. You know exactly what that sign means. If you know what it's one way or you know it's no entry, it's just got to be something. It's just got to be denoting where that where that charger is. There's got to, there's got to be something that we have that is introduced that is like a standard EV charging is here on these uh, in these areas. And it's got to be consistent and it's got to be accurate. I was in a, a park and ride in Oxford, not the Redbridge one and one over the other side. And I know there's a, I think it's a seven kilowatt AC charger in there. And you go in off the, the ring road and it says AC charging. Oh, no, it says electric vehicle charging. And it points and you, you go up to the end of the car park and then it says EV charging to the, to the right. So you follow along the EV charging to the right. And then the signs just disappear. So you're in the middle of this car park thinking, where is the charger? And of course, it's... Um, it's one of the small uh, AC charging points. So it's not a big unit that you can see from a distance. You've literally got to be almost on top of it before you go, oh, actually, it's there. So they kind of, they made the effort to put the charging signage in and then sort of 80% of the way they went, yeah, that's it. And just forgot about the rest of it. <laughs> Talk to me about how you're paying because you've talked about 
contact list. You've talked about uh, apps. You've talked about uh, roaming, things like uh, the, the RFID cards and that. And one of the big things that's come up uh, recently is pre-authorization. So talk to me about your understanding of pre-authorizations and any issues that you've sort of picked up on that. I suppose they, there's only, well, kind of two issues that I, well, one, one issue, one major issue that I had was actually on an app with a pre-authorization. I was at a, a, and this is what I was going to ask you, which was kind of about slow charging and things like that. But this was on a seven kilowatt charger and, and literally, so I thought I can plug it in for a few hours. I was staying overnight at this hotel and it wanted a £30 pre-authorization. Pre I tried to get it to work on the app that it was on and it went to my banking app for 30 quid, right? Okay. And it said, we won't take this until you, the charge has been completed. But then I got the spinning wheel of doom and it just went on and on and on. And I had reception on my phone. It wasn't as if I, had re I didn't have reception. So, so and, it, and it seemed to crash. So I tried again and it again came up with a £30 pre-authorization. And actually when I looked on my phone, I could see something saying that it was there. But again, so I tried again. Uh, again, I got the spinning wheel of doom. And I must admit, I think I tried one more time and I just thought, do you know what? I'm not even going to. I'm not even going to do this anymore because what happens if there's a cock up at their end and then I've got 90 quid actually on my, you know, that I've paid for that, that just wasn't, wasn't what I wanted. And then this week, so I, it wasn't, it wasn't quite a pre-authorization, but it was a top up on the, on the phone that I actually had to, I had to use one charging network, which is has been known not to be very good, but actually this was very, very good this week. I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm refusing. There are two issues with pre-authorizations. And as I say, I don't have an issue with pre-authorizations because the petrol pumps have been doing that for years and yeah. years and years. The two issues I have with pre-authorizations on electric vehicles is there's no consistency about the amount. There are certain people that charge a pound. There are certain people that charge Twenty pounds. There are certain people that charge thirty pounds, and why is that? And the second issue I have is exactly what you said there. You can have multiple failed charges, charges, but you still end up with the pre-authorizations on there, and they don't immediately always come off your your account. So if it was a case of I've had a thirty pound pre-authorization and the charge failed, and the the thirty pounds is refunded. And then I try again, I get another £30 pre-authorization and it fails and it's refunded. That wouldn't be an issue. But as you said, that's not what happens. It puts the £30 on, charge fails. You try again, puts another £30 on, charge fails. Try again, puts another £30 on. Pretty soon you're talking some serious money there. So I need to understand what the rationale is behind that and try and work out what, why is it? Because the other thing I understand is it, it's not consistent in the refunding policy. Like we know mutual friend Kate Tyrrell and she had pre-authorizations from, I'm not going to say who, but presumably the same charge point operator that you were referring to earlier. And she ended up not being able to get a charge and it took over a month for the pre-authorizations that were on that failed charge to actually get refunded back to her account. But I've had instances where I plugged in, it put 30 pounds, 40 pounds, whatever it was on the authorization. I put 15 pounds worth of electricity in and it's immediately offset the one against the other and just charged the, the difference to the account. So the pre-authorization's gone, the amount's been charged and everybody's happy, but there's no consistency about that. Talk to me about the financial aspect of moving to electric, because many people say that electric cars are too expensive and you know, you've had that conversation with me already, but did you know the base model Volkswagen Golf and the base model MG4 Electric are £400 difference in list price? What, for brand new now? Brand new now, yeah. 26500 for the base Golf, yeah. 26900 for the MG4 Electric. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Now, what, what was the, was there a financial aspect that uh, played into your decision to, to go electric? 
Absolutely. So, and that and that's really why we decided to go used EV. And and I know that there's been this whole thing about you know oh there isn't a lot of choice for used EVs in the market, which I'm sorry I've got to disagree with because there's blooming loads. You've just got to know what you're looking for. You know, you, I was looking because we were thinking about our son as well, and I was looking at prices for kind of like a used Nissan Leaf and you could get a used Nissan Leaf for about five grand and things like, you know, it depends what year, they're going to be older ones. But but for us, what you're saying there about the MG, MG4 and the and the brand new Golf, for a used, for a used um, Golf, when back in 2019, we bought our Golf. Um, I kind of don't really want to discuss how much we spent on it, but we got the Hyundai this time and it was 400 quid cheaper than the Golf Costas back in 2019. And we've gone electric. So, so there's, there's, no, there's no way that people can't say that it's affordable. It's just about looking really carefully at the used market. If you would normally buy a used car, then look at Auto Trader. That's what I did, you know, and talk to people like, it's about talking to people like you, you know, and because the one thing I found I found very difficult was conversations with dealerships. I've even I've even run a podcast on this myself because in my mind at the moment, until they change the rules, and I think they're changing the rules for 2024, aren't they? The dealerships are going to have to prove that they're going to be selling more EVs. I think this is going to be something like 22%, but even that is is too low in my mind. It's about, I gave feedback to my one of my local garages, one of my local dealer, dealerships, and I said, what you need to be doing is you need to make sure that your staff know about EVs, not just know about how they perform in your specific ones, but all the charging. We had we had a, a guy, a young guy, who was basically saying in front of me and my husband, oh, I'm a petrol head and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, sorry, I don't need to hear this because anybody else, it would put them off. The thing that's related to that, and I only found this out recently, if you go to a dealer and you say, I want an electric car, and he, he will look at you and he'll say, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. The electric car that you want will take six months, but we've got a hybrid, which you can walk away with today. And the, the reason they do that is because if they sell a hybrid today, they get the commission today. If they sell an entry vehicle that takes six months to arrive, they don't get the commission until it arrives and gets delivered in six months' time. So they're not incentivized to sell the electric vehicle. They're more incentivized to sell the thing that's there on the forecourt. And that's a big issue. Have you used AC destination charging yet? Right. Do you know what? I still get confused between AC destination charging. So that is, that is the same as I would use at home, isn't it? Basically, if you're using the cable that came supplied with your car, that's usually AC destination charging. Yeah, so I'm just proving to you that not everybody still gets the AC DC thingy, right? So, so yes, in fact, on Tuesday I did. So I tried to do that last week with a 7 kilowatt charger at a hotel that I'm not going to mention, but I did talk about it on uh, on. I kind of did an Instagram reel about this. So I that's the one that I was saying about there, the spinning wheel of doom in the, with the app. So I tried that one. And then this week I was staying at the Holiday Inn Express in Nuneaton and I used theirs because I kind of thought to myself, I'm staying overnight. There's no point in me actually using, there was a couple of rapid chargers and there was a couple of seven kilowatt AC chargers. So I, I put it on the AC charger and it was back up to 80% in three hours. So enough for me to get into the hotel, uh, get myself sorted, go across the way to this little carvery, um, have some food, come back and then take it off charge again. It's interesting how food figures quite a lot in, in people's charging regimes, doesn't it? Is it before food or is it after food? I could have left because my main thing was I thought, right, okay, I put it on there. I didn't realise, I suppose I kind of thought how many, I was trying to work out, like, how many hours is it going to take me to get back up to 80%. I think I was at about 45%. Okay. Right. And obviously kind of connecting it and the car kind of told me what percentage it was. And, and I just thought, well, I don't want it to be a hundred percent. 
So it was it, my main thinking was right. Okay, if I'm only going to put it, charge it to eighty percent, then I want to, I don't want to leave it actually overnight. I want to I want to take it away from that charging, you know, from that space, so that I don't block somebody else's ability to charge if they wanted to do that. So I, that's what I did, and I kept an eye on it. There's a there's a I looked at the um the app that I'd kind of was charging through. I looked at the my phone app for the car for the Hyundai, and double checked it just so I kind of knew, and it worked out perfectly, really. Now, in the middle of there, Liz mentioned pre-authorizations, and we had a quick discussion on the topic. It's an area which is starting to become something of an issue with contactless payments for various reasons. Unfortunately, charger pre-authorizations don't work the same way as petrol pump pre-authorizations. So to take us through the differences, I'd like to welcome Sarah Sloman to the show. Sarah is the Chief Strategy Officer at Paythrough, who are a fintech company specialising in EV payments. Hello, Sarah. Such a delight to be here. It's been about a year. You were a roundtable guest in episode 120 back in February 2022, alongside Pam Barbata from the Action Net Zero. Uh, now, you were still with Elmtronics then, and you've moved on and up. So tell us briefly what you do at Paythrough, please. Oh, Elmtronics is such a wonderful place to be, but this is all about putting software first. So hardware seems to be doing very well, looking after itself, and Paythrough is all about being future ready for EV charging. So it's offering that payment solution that puts what we call the user experience, so the customer interface at the heart of the decision-making process as to how to build the thing that you need to make the charges work. So it's really exciting. I'm learning every single day and I'm just delighted to be here because this topic is thorny. It certainly is. And as you say, we're talking pre-authorizations. Now, as, as, uh, as you know, we've just been chatting with Liz and she mentioned that she gets a little bit concerned when she knows that every time she attempts to have a charge, there's a, a public charge. There's a possibility of twenty pounds, thirty pounds, even seventy-five pounds with certain charge point operators coming out of her account and not necessarily going immediately back in at the end of the charge. So, do you want to sort of frame the problem that we're experiencing so the listeners understand what the fundamental issue is underneath all this, please? Yeah, it's worth noting that payments is something we're trying to make simple and therefore easy to understand. However, as you can imagine, there's a lot of complexity behind it. And that's why the company exists. And that's why we've got experts. So I've consulted three different people internally. We've got David Martin, who's our chief product officer. He works out how everything's going to slot together. And then our chief technical officer, uh, who is Mark Braybrook, and he's offered lots of information about how this all works too. And of course, our MD founder, Keith Brown. So this isn't actually just me and my ideas. This is a bit of my experience plus the reality behind it. And Liz, you're absolutely right. I feel your pain just this weekend. I had to do uh, six failed pre-authorizations. And there was me watching the money disappearing from my account instantly thinking, well, that's that's great. And I'm never going to get that back. So I couldn't get the uh, couldn't get the charger to work. But of course, I did get it back. And not only that, it came back instantly, which showed me that that CPO, that charge point operator, has worked out how, with the sort of infrastructure behind the scenes in the software layers, how to make that money come back instantly. And what we know, Gary, from chatting with our groups is that every charge point operator here in the UK seems to do this a little bit differently. And so I thought I'd lift the lid a little bit on why, why that is. Why does pre-authorization amount differ and why isn't there a standard amount. And then, and then more than that, why isn't that amount immediately refunded back to your card? So is it all right to just delve into that a little bit now? Head, head straight into it, Sarah. From my understanding of talking to all these people and, and working with different charge point operators across the UK and Europe, actually, is this is all about protecting what we call the merchant. So in this case, that's the charge point operator. So this process is about checking that you actually have money in that account. It works very familiarly to people like when the hotel industry, where, of course, when you arrive, they take that amount as a sort of reserve and promise that you're going to get it back. And you can sometimes see it lurking in your account under pending transactions. That isn't really pending. It hasn't really gone. It doesn't sort of get refunded in that case. It just reappears. Um, but it means that you can't then go and empty your account and then leave the hotel without paying. So it's a little bit like that. Now, obviously in EV charging, it's, it's different because you've got AC and DC and others are more expensive. So we tend to see different amounts on the AC network compared to the DC network. And that's because we, when that charge is being sort of preempted, we need to understand how much risk the merchant, that's the charge point operator, will be prepared to take on. Now, these vary from one pound through to 15 pounds 
all the way up, as you said, to £75. But actually, each one of those amounts functions in a different way. So for example, that £75 one sounds terrifying, but they've structured theirs in a way that it does come back instantly. That £1 one doesn't come back instantly. I've seen 15, I've seen 30, I've seen 35. And I just received an email to say that my neighbouring, my local one is going up to £35. And that's one of the other ones that doesn't come back instantly. So it's not about the sort of money sort of being taken. It's just held. It's held until the card can release it from the merchant. And that will happen at the end of the charging session, but can take three, five, even seven days. So when a charger fails, that's when we see the consumer have the experience of sort of despair, like Liz was describing, because you have to swipe and swipe again and hope that the third time, fourth time lucky, that charger actually works. And then sometimes those those amounts are held and it can be very frustrating to know that that money isn't accessible to you at that point. So something that we're working on quite closely is, is working with the CPO to sort of really understand their risk before they take the process of deciding how they're going to set up their incremental authorizations. Here's a snazzy new standard for you, MC5552. <laughs> this is, is a payment card industry standard. It's not here yet. It's what, like many, we're moving towards it. And this is going to overcome that disparity in the pre-authorization amounts and the refund time scale. So that's on the card industry to kind of work with us in the charge point operator industry to work that out. But this will incrementally increase an initially lower pre-authorized amount. So it could start at five pounds. And if you're continuing to draw energy, 10, 15, 20, depending on how much you need to use, it will protect the merchant because it will continually check that there's money in that account. Right. So the two big problems that I personally have, and I think Liz will sort of echo this, is if if I go to CPO A mm. and I'm on a 50 kilowatt charger and um, I get a pre-authorization. It could be as little as a pound. If I go to CPO B that has the same charger and is giving me the same amount of electricity, the pre-authorization could be seventy-five pounds. Why is there not a standardised value? Why did different CPOs feel the need to have different pre-authorization values? Now I've got this one from the horse's mouth, having spoken to each one of them about this, and it's down to two things. Appetite of risk, so how much are they willing to risk versus how much they know they already lose. So charge point operator A with the one pound um, hasn't really noticed this risk being a reality. They haven't, as far as they know, lost money in this process. I would say that's for now. I don't know what will happen in the future. But the fact that the rest of the market players have all sort of decided to be more risk averse, I suppose, by offering the sort of £30 being the average as far as my research goes. Um, I think that's all about deciding what are they willing to risk as take, taking it on. So the next question then is, my mum could take her 10-year-old Kia Picanto down to the petrol station, put £30 with the petrol in with a contactless card, and she doesn't have to worry about the issue of having a £99 pre-authorization taken from her account. It happens, she's not bothered. At the end of the day, she's put her £30 in, the remainder is sent back to her account. Why is charge of payment different? Why do we have the situation where it can take up to seven days to refund uh, for a charge? I do feel, and I, I echo the sentiment of my, my team here, that banks could do a lot more to explain to customers how their cards and payments actually work. Now, I hope I don't get this wrong, but I believe the difference to be customer present, customer not present. So at a charger, or let's use the fuel example again, if you go to a fuel forecourt and use pay at pump, you will have to put a £99 pre-authorization held amount onto your card. Remember that? I remember doing that. I haven't been <laughs> a long time, but I do recall that process. Um, but if you go in and you're required to swipe your card, the merchant is there in person being represented by the person behind the till, and you are too. So if that card payment fails, that person won't let the driver leave, your mum. <laughs> Um, and I can imagine blue sirens and high drama. It's obviously absolutely not the case, but you're forced then to try a different card. Um, the other thing that it could be happening with in-person payments is cards have to be, ha you're using your card yourself physically every time. At some stage, you're going to be challenged for your chip and pin. So when you've got the customer present process, you don't need to risk that sort of reserved amount because you're right there face to face. On a charge point, you're not. And you could take 50, 60 quids worth of electricity and not have the money on your account ever and drive off and do that over and over again before they catch up with you. But does that answer the question of why when my mother sort of pays at the pump, the £99 is pre-authorised? She takes £30 worth of fuel and the £99 goes back 
instantaneously. What? Why can that not happen for all CPOs? I mean, you, you said, yes, it happened on the one that, that you gave the example of earlier, but I don't think that's common across the industry, is it? It's not yet. No, it isn't yet. And that all boils down to the sort of mechanics behind the scenes. So you've got the charge point operator who conveys the amount of energy used, and then that payment has to be processed. You've got multi-party operators hiding behind the scenes, sort of passing information back and forth. And if you set that up in a chain whereby you're happy to have that money released immediately, that comes down to which sort of, I guess, bank you choose to use in the meantime. Now, not all CPOs are sort of aware of this, which is why I really wanted to come on on your show, because I do think there's a call from consumers to know exactly where their money is is going. I've been I've been foul of having 90 plus pounds just sat there. Now, with the fuel example, that as you say, the amount that she took in fuel is the only amount that ever left her account officially. That 99 pounds just drifts back in as and when it can. I've certainly never had it instantly off Tesco or whoever my local one is, my local fuel station. Um, but it, it, is, it is actually the same problem in disguise. So like you said, of all the CPOs in the UK, some do it instantly, some do not. I really hope that this new standard, this MC5552, will alleviate that concern from drivers. And I often talk about fleet. Like imagine if you're going around and you're not uh, lucky enough to have a sort of corporate fleet card or a roaming card or something that you can see clearly where that money is going, when it's going and who's taking it and maybe the company is paying. If it's just you and or, or I was on the weekend with my credit card, constantly, desperately trying to get charges to work. And I'm entirely personally reliant on the public network, as you know. So I really do have sympathy for this. And I'm really glad that you and Liz have, have raised it. But Hopefully this standard will encourage charge point operators to think more sort of in a logical step. So let's do £5, £10, £15, £20. What is your average transaction value? Perhaps half of that halves your risk. Perhaps that's a more supportive appetite for the consumer then to face a £25 pre-off rather than the sort of £35. Or perhaps we all go to this £1 thing, but I do know from different industries that £1 can be risky. Well, yes, because that then brings up the, the whole area of, of fraud. Uh, I was chatting with Neil Riddle from uh, Power, former friend, former guest on the podcast. And he was telling me that one reason a number of companies have altered their pre-authorization amounts is to combat fraud. They have, uh, for example, or they used to have a, on one particular CPO, a £5 pre-authorization limit. And taxi drivers or Uber drivers in London turned up with a Revolut uh, card, which was pre-authorized with £5 and a penny. So they used that to authorize the... Uh, the charge, they filled up with £60 worth of uh, electricity and left. So they've effectively got £55 of charge for free. And that continued until the pre-authorization was high enough to deter the majority of the people. They kept having to increase it and increase it. So do you get any sense, uh, I mean, you mentioned risk earlier on, do you get any sense of how big the fraud issue plays into all this? I honestly think we are yet to fully understand or appreciate this. I really honestly think that there is revenue lost on a daily basis, particularly in the transport sector. A good example being, I did it myself completely and utterly by mistake. I have a Monzo card rather than Revolut, but it's one that I just keep as a spare for, you know, tap and go type things. And I hadn't topped it up, but I obviously had enough in there to get through the barrier and exit the barrier, but I don't think I had enough to cover my TFL charges for that day. So luckily that's three or four pounds to them that I've taken from them by mistake. But I think when it comes to EV charging, as we talked about, it could be anything from 10 pounds all the way up to 60 or 70, depending on the price per kilowatt hour. So I think we are yet to see the truth of how this will unfold, especially as well, we're still in that sort of we are just coming out, as I'd say, the early adopter phase. We're still exploring things like power cards where everything's clearly accounted for. We're still using knowledge like Paythrough has to work with merchants and banks and acquirers and card issuers and charge point operators to get to the bottom of what works best with the lowest risk to the merchant, which is the charge point operator, and the lowest discomfort for who's paying you, which is the consumer. So one of the reasons I wanted to work at Payter is they truly put the driver first. It's about whether you're a fleet driver or a private driver. It's about what works for you. Because of course, if somebody isn't enjoying the experience of that charge point operator, they'll roll their eyes and go to a different one. I won't be using that one at the weekend, even though they refunded me the six times that it took me to get it to start. It was just disconcerting and took a lot of time, very, very annoying. So I think the user experience when seamless and when fair 
will make a more profitable industry for all of us. So I'm hoping we can keep this conversation going and more and more people off the back of your podcast, Gary, will come forward and say their experience so we can work together to solve it. It's really not rocket science. It's quite an old industry. We just haven't got it quite right. Absolutely. Final question. You mentioned the MC5552 standard. Do we know uh, timelines for when that may be coming into, uh, into play? No, I think it's a bit like ISO 15118. It's been around a long time, but not quite signed, sealed, delivered, adopted by everybody yet. But I'm, I'm particularly excited about it when I started to peek at what it could mean. Um, but like all these things, you can rely on me to get it hot off the press. Is there anything you'd like to say sort of to wrap up on this? Is there anything we haven't covered? Just keep going. What I love about your podcast and Liz Allen's and the Evie Cafe, actually, it's three very reliable podcasts who really don't want to create more myths, quite the opposite. We're trying to bust those myths. So honestly, if people can get in touch with their experiences, it just helps us to understand what's happening out there and helps us to advise as well, pay through. We're very much sort of built by EV industry experts behind the scenes, and we apply that sort of financial technology to solve the riddle. So we're working with lucky to be working with quite a few charge point operators, not just in the UK. So I really want to continue sharing that learning and stopping stopping the UK from making similar mistakes. Why would we? Why would we not want to learn from other parts of the world? I think that's uh, an excellent place to, uh, to draw it to a close. So Sloman, thanks for your uh, time today. Thank you, Gary. Let's keep going. Keep the conversation flowing. Absolutely. My thanks to both Liz and to Sarah for their time. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. We're all after the holy grail of ultra rapid charging in a short time, right? Well, Neobolt, or Neobolt, a UK company, has demonstrated tech recently that allows a 35 kilowatt hour battery to be fully charged in less than six minutes. The spin off from the University of Cambridge is reportedly developing batteries with anodes made of niobium and tungsten, which should enable particularly short charging times. Neobolt says that it has not been able to detect any significant loss of performance in its batteries, even after more than 2,000 fast charge cycles. The corresponding battery technology is to be scaled up next year. Six minutes? It should be enough for those who still think that they should be able to charge in the same length of time it takes to fill a fuel tank, right? The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapmap the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV driver search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric is available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, You've Gone Renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you got to this point by tweeting me at MusingZV with the words, fellow Yorkie. Hashtag, if you know, you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder, Simon. You know, if the whole unicycle, personal electric vehicle, battery electric vehicle thing doesn't take off and we end up going back to the original method of transport, horse and cart, you'll be fine. He lives next to a farm and he's got it on good authority that everything is set up to return to the good old days of four-legged travel, carts, carriages and blacksmiths. The animals are raring to go. Now I've got this one from the horse's mouth having spoken to each one of them. Thanks for listening. Bye.